things back but somewhere so they yeah. don't get destroyed. Yeah. Um, a few of them I'm going to take to wash, and then some other ones just look, they were so wrinkled. I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed because I, I, oh, maybe these people took them home and didn't iron them. That could be. And yeah, brought them back. Really okay. I so I'm going to really iron those, and then the other ones had just, they didn't have much on them as far as maybe a spot or two. I just thought I was washing. And then, oh, they didn't get all the ones off that had. I think the ones, I mean, they were like very, very little spots. I thought, what they have, I'll go ahead and wash them. That, but that makes sense because they were really wrinkled. I'm like, okay, no, I ironed those. Yeah, the, at least I ironed, ones. you know, the bottom part. Yeah. yeah so I was like, why do some ones. of them look really ironed and some of them don't? People don't iron. Yeah, who likes to do that? I don't know. Oh, I was I going to, so I was going to keep it, I was going to keep it like on the other one. No, that's a good one. So these I'm just gonna hold and put them in the you know, hang, 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 hang them out. This is they still look pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's appropriate. <laughs> I was just saying I didn't know what to expect. Oh. Well, Marlene, she wanted to leave at five, and I said, mm, that's pretty early. I don't want to be too early. I don't know. Is the Stewart's in the first town or the second town? Second. It's the second one. Okay. Yeah, it's about 28 minutes from here. So is it not the, is it not the big church that's on the highway? No, it's Trinity. Okay. That's the one that has the school. Yeah. Right. So it's two years. I don't think I've ever been to that one. I've been to that small game. Are we taking the runners off also? Or no, we the runners on. Oh, we keep the runners on. Okay. Thank you. I feel like we Are need to take them home. Spring. 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 Well, All right. Spring, that's still available. Well, do we do we want to begin? Oh, I think it's going to be full blown summer. <laughs> it's uh, because it's supposed to be like eighty. It's eleven oh three. Okay. And um. No, no, not trying to. Uh, I know. Not trying to hurry you along, but. Uh, the great unwashed internet masses are they're, they're waiting they're clamoring at the door of the of the uh, of the castle we no are coming. Uh, always excited and ready to learn about the mass <laughs> <laughs> very pertinent very long article yeah. Very long article. Um, we're almost done, so we'll have to think about what we're going to do after this. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, topic. Yeah. We could talk about numbers uh, in the Bible, not the book of numbers, but just numbers. Um, and maybe that'll energize our in-person gathering. But uh, when do you start with the beat? Is that today? Uh, that's not today. Just not today, no. Okay. When do we start with what? There's some members of the beacon that he's going to do a small Bible study for. Yeah, so we were thinking here. here, they'll be coming here uh, because they have to. There's a law that mandates that they all have to. Um, uh, they'll they have to. Uh, uh, <laughs> Eileen heard me call her the unwashed masses on there. Uh, <laughs> all except for Eileen. That's why. Um, 
there's a law, a new, a new, uh, a uh, state of Illinois law amongst the billions of new laws that they make each year, that um, they the those folks have to leave their campus uh, in order to do activities. So uh, I think the thought is we're going to be doing um, uh, something here, a Bible study, um, very low key. Uh, that fits that demographic of people. So uh, I'm still trying to work out in my head what that's going to look like um, without being too much. So I was told that what we're doing now on Thursday morning is probably too much for them. Well, since they're not Lutheran, they may not really care. <laughs> yeah, I think I think just focusing on, you know, maybe we'll yeah. just make our way through uh, key high points, Bible stories and... Uh, any, I think any, right now, I think they're doing veggie tales, is what they're doing for them. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> and veggie tales is problematic. It's just, uh, um, it's, 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 uh, it's Christian moralism. It teaches kids. I might come to that Bible study. It's kind of uh -huh. Yeah. It, they are cute. They are cute. It, there was an article by the guy who created veggie tales a while back who lamented his creation of it because. It wasn't really teaching an explicit gospel. It was a teaching morals, rights and wrong, which is fine. Yeah. But um, but the problem was it was marketed um, several decades ago as a means of which parents could evangelize it's their funny. children. Yeah. But yeah. It's not, it's but it's not. It's moralism. Yeah, it, I think it's, it's just something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like mm -hmm. appropriate for your kids to watch, but it's not something you use. To yeah. Them. Right. Yeah. 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 And again, I uh, we're often very quick. Uh, myself included, to uh, push off the things of our vocation that God has given us. So, uh, well, let's uh, let's pray, and we'll we'll open it up here. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you you give us you give us your good and gracious gifts. They come to us in the divine service. You care for us in your service, um, and that's what makes it yours. And then we respond with the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving, and we respond ultimately in faith. You do all these things to build faith in us, and so your word comes, both read and preached and sung, and your word in its, in its greatest form in, in the Lord's Supper and Holy Communion. Lord, bless us as we understand and talk about the Mass, your divine service, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, Mass, that should make people, uh, North American Lutherans, uncomfortable. Um, especially if you said the Lutheran Mass, um, and the word uh, Mass comes from a Misa, which means sent, um, and so in the 6th and 7th century, uh, the Latin word, I mean, the, the, the Mass, the church service is done in Latin, um, and it's way to describe uh, the Eucharistic celebration, so the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, uh, because at the conclusion of it, uh, the priest would say, you know, go, you're the ones sent out into the world, um, misa est. And so uh, uh, it, it, it evolved, the language evolved into saying that you're going to the mass. So kind of ironic that you're going to the mass to be sent, um, going somewhere to be sent away, uh, but sent away forgiven. And so when you talk about Lutheran, Lutheran mass, um, do we have a Lutheran mass? Yeah, we do. Um, I think the word mass is usually associated with Roman Catholics, um, at least in this country, but um, to say a Lutheran mass would be very common in Germany um, and in other parts of Europe. Um, and they actually, uh, if you go and look at some older uh, congregations, Lutheran congregations in North America, particularly there are two that are in New York City, um, they still call it the German Mass, the, the Lutheran Mass they have. So, um, so Mass just means divine service, uh, the Lord's service, right? Um, the service of word and sacrament put together. Um, and so uh, it does become problematic if, if I if I only said Mass here at church, people would probably uh, freak out, you know. Um, and uh, but it, it would be an accurate term to use. However. Um, it wouldn't be as clear. It would probably uh, raise more questions than it does answer anything. So divine service is probably a better way of describing it. Divine service is a better way of saying than worship. 
uh, because often when we think of Lutheran worship, it's not the same as North American evangelical Protestant worship. Um, and so uh, there's a little uh, way of explaining it. Um, most folks would think of worship as one way. I go to church um, to worship God, uh, to give God praises. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that's the purpose of church, for me to go there and praise God. And that's true, but that's only one side of what's happening in the divine service. So uh, biblical worship, Lutheran worship, is always a two-way street. Um, I go to church uh, for God to give me his things, um, and then I respond to those things that he gives me with prayer, praise, thanksgiving. But ultimately, and, and in the article, it's pretty clear that um, the ultimate gift and response that we give in worship to God is faith. That's what he wants from us. Um, because that's what, um, that's what we cling to, right? Uh, faith alone um, in salvation. Um, that's the purpose of the service, to give you faith. Um, and so there is a, an element of a sacrifice of praise or thanksgiving. You could call it a Eucharistic sacrifice in which um, you're not sacrificing an animal or a body, but you're giving to God praises and thanksgiving for what he's done for you. But that's actually how the, the entire Bible is written when God interacts with his people, right? God... <laughs> leads his people out of slavery in Egypt. They respond each time he does these miraculous works to them with praising and thanking him. It's never, it's never people praising God and in that praise, it invokes him to do things for them. That is paganism. So the idea of I go to church to worship God and in my worship of God, that creates, I'm like rewarded. I'm rewarded. Yeah. That is paganism, right? But unfortunately, um, in, in North America, it, in, and in, you know, broader Protestantism, that seems to be the idea um, that that's what's happening. When I was colloquized and I went through that process, the interview, they did ask me the question, what is worship? And the answer, I don't know if this is the right answer, the right answer where the answer they were looking for had little to do with Sunday, but they, what they were looking for was, what do you do outside of church? Prayer, interactions, um, devotion time. Yeah. Um, uh, I would say- The message of Jesus. Right. That's what the answer they were looking for. That wasn't the answer I exactly gave them, but that's what they wanted me to say. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like most people kind of just parrot these sort of catchphrases that they hear, you yeah, know, catchy little things. Like yeah. The, the thing is, though, if you look in scripture, the center of God's people's life in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is in worship. It is in, in the Lord's Supper. It's in the Word, right? And that's the thing that gives you faith. Um, and that's the thing that forgives your sins. And so that, uh, as the center of your life, uh, that then flows all these things out of it. God's done this good work in me. He's given me faith. He's given me his Holy Spirit. He's forgiven my sins. Now I'm going to go out, right? That's why it's mass and I'm sent. I'm sent out as a person set apart by God to go and love my neighbor. I can actually go and love my neighbor now because God has loved me first. And so um, while things like devotions and prayer life at home and, and even having the vocation of sharing the gospel with other people, um, that's the... Uh, the Is symptoms, the result, the, result yeah. the effect of, of uh, going in to worship. Um, and that's what happens in God's, I mean, what is the, the center of people's life in the Old Testament? It's the temple and it's temple worship. That's why when the temple's destroyed, the people are beside themselves. Um, what's the center of worship in the New Testament, right? Acts 2.42, this is what they did. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the breaking of bread, which is Holy Communion, the prayers, which are formal prayers of God's people coming together as a church, um, and uh, fellowship in being in, in the service with one another. Um, and so uh, 
it, it really centers around uh, the divine service, and at the, the pinnacle of it, too, is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Um, so I, I think it's an important distinction. It's a really big distinction between us and um, other I'll try not to whinge too much when I say it. Other Protestants, right? If we're if we're category put, putting us in the category of Protestants, um, it's the big thing that separates us because most people, I mean, if we go across the street when they go to church, what are they doing? They're praising, and so if it, if if I view worship as a one way street in which I have to give God my praises all the time, then that's going to drive me to be able to get into the 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 right mood and the right set of mind to do so. And so I'll need certain types of music. I'll need certain environments to sort of invoke that in me so I can give it. Um, if it's all about faith, uh, faith alone, the alone is the hard part in worship, which is what we would confess. God is doing things to me in there and I'm responding to it. And so then all the things in worship are designed to teach me what God is doing to me how God is changing this world and me and everyone around me. And so all the things we do, the rites and the rituals and the ceremonies um, and the, the preaching, the word and the, and Holy communion, all of that stuff is designed to communicate to me. This is what's happening to you right now. God is doing something unique to you. Um, and, uh, and he wants you to have faith. So why do you wear all the robes? Why do you have all the candles? Why do you have all the altar coverings? All this stuff. It's why to say, why do we choose the hymns that we have? And They're that, designed to teach know, and invoke song faith. That might invoke an emotion. Right. Think about it that way. Right. It's hard to think about it that way. Yeah. I, well, because, I mean, again, and, and I'm guilty of this too. We all have this innate thing within us, this sinful desire that, 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 I don't want to receive, I want to give, and I'm going to give to God. And then when I give him the right thing, he's going to do something for me. But God is like, you're awful, just flat out, no matter what you do, I'm going to take care of you, even though, right, even though you don't deserve it. Um, and it, it ultimately gives him a greater amount of glory because you're the one receiving it. This is why Jesus gathers little children around him and said, if you don't have a faith like a child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Some of that is the fact that as you get older, right, these blockades of reason and logic come into your mind um, and you have a hard time believing the things of God. But most of that has to do with the fact that when he brings children, He's bringing infants, little kids, and, and he's saying, if you're not like them, you can't enter the kingdom of God. That means completely receiving what he's giving. I mean, infants don't offer anything. They don't. I mean, they, they offer love and affection, obviously, right? Um, because they love their parents, and that is a response to what their parents are doing. But if anything, an infant in a house, for the most part, brings about more hardship for the parents than it does, you know, uh, <laughs> sleepless nights and, and you're caring for someone constantly, but they, they are ultimately just, you know, people that just receive completely. Um, and so that's the thought in, in worship in, in the mass, um, as well. Uh, <clears throat> Lutheran masses, right? So in Luther, he reforms, okay. Lutheran reforms of the mass and the divine service are about keeping right it's the conservative reformation it's about keeping what the church has inherited historically and what has always done but refining it so that it's not um blasphemous and that's what was happening at the time of the reformation there are some things going on in the roman catholic mass they still go on that are an abomination that's what luther would say to god um, and we'll talk about those re-sacrificing of christ is one of them um, and uh, private masses for money. Um, and uh, so for Luther in Wittenberg, they really had Luther put together in his um, book uh, when he talks about the German mass and liturgies, he outlines two really prominent things that he's doing, right? First, he retains um, the formula mise, the, the actual Latin mass. Um, that was still practiced in Wittenberg at the time of the Reformation. It was still practiced for a very long time. They retained Latin, 
Um, and they, again, Wittenberg is a university, so you have very intelligent people there who are gathered, um, who are speaking Latin as well. You have people from other parts of Europe who are coming to Wittenberg to study at the university. And because the church's language was Latin, and if you wanted to be a scholar, you spoke Latin, Latin was the only thing that you could really communicate with other people if you didn't speak German. And so, um, so again, you know, uh, Latin is retained, it's retained for learning. I have a quote here from Luther. He didn't, didn't want to discontinue the service in, in the Latin language because, because young people are my primary concern, which sounds crazy now to think that, oh, why would you retain Latin if young people are your concern? But what he wanted to do was teach them Latin and Greek and Hebrew and so that he could have the fullness of what the church has inherited historically. Because the Christian church is not just something that sprung up here. Our church is not of its own self in Sullivan. Our church was planted by another church, which was planted by another church, which was planted by another church. And um, those churches are his, inherit the uh, historic heritage of the Christian church in general. You're part of a long history that goes back to the apostles. Uh, because if you don't, then, then you're not part of the church. The true church. So, um, so all those things that that bring in the fullness of teaching, um, and uh, Latin is included in that, and Hebrew and Greek. And there's a big thing here too, where he talks about songs and singing. All the songs are written in Latin, right? And so uh, there's something that can be communicated in those hymns. Um, in Latin that have a hard time being communicated in German and in English. So um, if, you, if you've ever sung a song in church, and I'm sure there are plenty of them, um, that the words didn't really rhyme or didn't really sound like it made a lot of sense, that's because it was originally written in Latin um, or German for that matter, although German is much closer to English. And that, um, you know, there's something that gets lost in that as well. Uh, and there's actually a resurgence of this too. I mean, classical education, which is a very prominent thing now and in Lutheran circles is the teaching of Latin again. Um, but here's something that's interesting. When the Concordia Seminary, right, when it was founded, when they built their new, let me see if I got this right. When they built their new campus in the twenties, which is where it's at now, moving from downtown St. Louis, they gathered together and they sang a mighty fortress is our God in Latin. And then in the 60s, when they completed Luther Tower, right, because it wasn't completed when they first built it, they sang a mighty fortress is our God in German. And now they sing it in English. So um, some of that is things that get lost um, in our church and culture. So not necessarily always bad, but then there was the German mass, right? So again, Luther writes that he arranges the German mass for the sake of simple lay people so that people can understand what's going on. And that's part of the article where they talk about, I mean, things should be in the language of the people, right? Because faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And so if I have no idea what's going on, um, and if you've ever been to a Latin mass before, um, I have in South St. Louis, right? You don't really know what's going on. In fact, I just remember sitting in a low mass. That means it's an unsung mass. Uh, everything's just said. You're sitting in, in, a, in a side, you're not at the high altar. So the big altar of this big, beautiful South side cathedral, which is this big Gothic cathedral. You're sitting in a side altar. It's very dark. Uh, the priest never makes eye contact with you. In fact, he looked like he was possessed because he kept doing this. And, and um, you know, everything's in Latin and you would think, man, if I was like a German peasant at the time, I'd be like, man, God's really mad at me. And I go, <laughs> I'm going to get my stuff straight. But because um, you don't know what's going on. And, and still that language of promise and, and plus the words, our Lord's words, the words of institution are not pronounced or sung. They're said quietly as a secret. Um, and in the old um, Roman Catholic order for mass, it's still like that. I think in the new uh, mass that's very similar to ours in which it's pronounced. But um, So the things we confess, right? Article 24, 
on the mass responds to these Roman accusations that we've abolished everything. Um, and uh, it's simply not true. So uh, our uh, tradition, our, the way we worship, uh, the, the reforms only made small changes. Um, and it wasn't as if we threw the baby out with the bathwater. That happens in the Swiss Reformation. So John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli in particular, um, those folks that uh, are the origin of um, the Anabaptist as well, Anabaptist, th those folks uh, who find their origin in modern uh, or they're, they're, uh, they're, those who are modern Protestants find their origin with them. Um, that was the Radical Reformation, right? So they, they considered it a revolution. They're going to redo everything. Uh, they divorced the history from what the church had been doing. And frankly, it, I don't think it worked out well for them. Um, and so that's not what we're doing in the conservative uh, Reformation. Lutheran's not, Luther's not trying to revolt. He's trying to say, let's get back on track uh, and uh, let's do things pleasing to God and not um, things in the mass that are evil. So I've broken it up. The article is rather long, and uh, but I'll, I've got some portions here that we'll, we'll just break them down to go through. So part one, our churches are falsely accused of abolishing the mass. In fact, the mass is retained among us and is celebrated with great reverence. Almost all the customary ceremonies are also retained, ex except that German hymns added for the instruction of people. Interesting, that's the use of hymns are interspersed here and there along with the Latin, among the Latin ones. Ceremonies are uh, especially needed so that the unlearned may be taught. Paul uh, prescribed that in the church, a language should be used that the people understand. So 1 Corinthians 14 uh, verses two and nine. All those who are able to, uh, to do so receive the sacrament together. Uh, this also increases the reverence and devotion of public worship for no one is admitted unless he uh, is first heard and examined. Uh, the people also retain, uh, remind, uh, are reminded about the dignity and the use of the sacrament and the great consolation it offers to anxious consciences that they may learn to believe in God and ask for and accept, expect from him all that is good. Such worship pleases God and, and such use of the sacrament nourishes devotion to God. So it does not appear that the mass is more devoutly observed among our adversaries, Roman Catholics, than among us. Um, so some things to point out, right? The mass is still retained. Um, and again, and we've talked about this before, the things we do in our divine service can be traced all the way back to the first and second century. Um, and they're practiced with great reverence. Um, and so uh, this is what the Lord prescribes in the New Testament as well. In the Old Testament, um, in fact, in the Old Testament, God is pretty unforgiving when worship isn't done with reverence and the fear of God. Um, it often ends up in somebody dying, namely the high priest, or when the people's worship has faltered um, and is without faith or reverence to God, um, they're thrown into exile. <laughs> So, and the temple's destroyed. So uh, it's kind of, um, uh, it's kind of important uh, to God. So Hebrews 12, 28. So since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God in reverence um, and fear in a way that pleases him. Um, reverence is that key word there. Uh, almost all ceremonies are retained, except German hymns are added. Interesting enough, German hymns are added so that people can be taught. That's the purpose of hymns, is teaching people. Um, and uh, that's the really the purpose of the service. Everything that's done in the service is teaching you something about what's happening. Um, and so that's why some things are done more deliberately than others. Um, and some things might be emphasized too um, at certain seasons of the church based on what people need to be taught. Um, and the article cites 1 Corinthians 14, 
Uh, Paul writes, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries uh, in the spirit. So with yourselves, if your tongue, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. So um, Paul is telling those in Corinth that when you're speaking to God, right, which is in the divine service, he's talking about the service, um, then it should be something that's intelligible, right? Uh, which kind of actually contradicts, and we haven't really talked a lot about this, but the modern idea of speaking in tongues in Pentecostal churches, um, because a lot of it is babbling where people uh, make utterances of the spirit and they're like, blah, 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 blah. And nobody knows what they're saying, right? So the only time that you really see that happening in scripture is, you know, people don't know what's happening or what they're saying and people are talking crazy is when people are demonically possessed, okay? Because even in Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, when people are speaking tongues, they're yes, speaking yes, foreign languages, yeah. Um, and there's no such thing as angels speak, by the way. And that's what some Pentecostals would say as well. Because if you look in scripture, when angels speak to people, they know what they're saying. They're not going blah, 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 right? They're not scat man, skee bit about pop doo right? So um, something important to point out, right? So again, right, all this stuff is retained because if we confess that Jesus is really present in the sacrament, that he's with us in that moment, that's going to cause us to act a certain way and to communicate that to people. It's really hard to believe that, right? Um, it's really hard to have faith in things that are unseen, right? And this is why I have John 20, which is actually the reading for this um, Sunday coming up. Jesus said, he says to Thomas, after Thomas was like, I'm not going to believe until I see it. And I put my fingers in there, you know, and Jesus is like, all right, here you go. And he goes, oh, my Lord, and my God. And then Jesus says, have you believed because you, you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So you're communicating these things that, that are not being seen, but that are happening and occurring, right? And Jesus is talking about us now. And so it's very hard to believe what we're confessing, the unseen realities, because sin clouds our eyes, right? Paul talks about viewing the world through a mirror dimly lit, and that's us. And so all these things happen so that we can, we can really sort of uh, see or uh, give us the eyes of faith to see um, that God is really present. Jesus is present in the sacrament with us. Um, and so again, you, you should act a certain way. Um, that's why there's kneeling and bowing and all these things like that, because that'll happen on the last day, right? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. So um, and, and that last day, praise God, it'll be glorified bodies that don't have knee problems and things like this as well. So, <laughs> so again, the center, right? You can see from the first part of the article, the center of worship is the sacrament. He's talking about the sacrament and they're examining people, um, first and it's the sacrament is given for anxious conscience, right? You've got uh, a, a troubled conscience because of, of sin. Jesus is coming in and comforting you and saying your sins are forgiven, right? Um, and so the people are instructed and they're receiving the sacrament. Um, and I'll, I'll pull out a few other quotes here to show you uh, what that looks like at Luther's time as well. Um, so something to point out. It's very Lutheran to offer, right, the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, every Sunday. Um, because at the time of the Reformation, they were, there was only the requirement, right, that the church gave was once a year, right? You got to go to confession, and you got to go receive the Lord's Supper once a year. And you're just receiving the body, right? You're not receiving the blood. And so um, uh, it's very Lutheran because... It's very church, Christian, early church practice to receive the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Um, now, that changed throughout church history. Uh, in the Reformation, it changed because 
Um, they, they viewed what was happening in the Lord's Supper and in the Mass to be something different, right? And they viewed it as, which we'll find out a little bit later, that I can go and pay somebody to do it for me and get the benefits from it. Um, and then I don't have to do it myself. I can go back to the field and, you know, till my field or whatever I do um, as a German peasant, you know. And um, I could just pay someone else to do it, right? In the Missouri Senate, in our early days, maybe in the 19th century, there was a bunch of reasons why they might not celebrate the sacrament every Sunday. One of them was because they just didn't have a pastor, right? Pastors rode a circuit. In the early part, there wasn't that many pastors. <clears throat> there wasn't a Lutheran seminary here in, in North America till much later from immigration, right? So Lutheran pastors would have to be coming over from Germany. And so you have a pastor who has a circuit of, you know, sometimes four, sometimes eight churches. And that's why we get a circuit. There's circuit riders. They would ride the circuit to preaching stations, or they would ride them to do the Eucharist, uh, the Lord's Supper. And, um, and so some, the congregation then would gather um, when they didn't have a pastor and just do a service of the word. And, and that practice sort of keeps going, uh, even when we have uh, a, a plenty of pastors now. Too. And then there's a bunch of other reasons why people do this uh, that don't celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday as well um, in a Lutheran church, because not all Lutheran churches do that. Um, but as we'll see, at Luther's time, they're doing it pretty much every day. In the early church, they're doing it every day. And you have to ask yourself or imagine a world where people live in community with each other and we go and worship um, we're in the service every single day, what that does to people. Um, it's going to be a positive thing. Uh, so uh, it's the beginning of our own uh, monastery here in Sullivan. Uh, part two. Uh, it is clear that for a long time, the most public and serious complaint among all good people is that the mass has been made base and uh, profane by using it to gain filthy wealth, right? First Timothy 3, 3. Yeah, everyone knows how great this abuse is in all the churches. They know that sort of men say masses for a fee or an income, and how many celebrate these masses contrary to canon law. Paul severely threatens those who use the Eucharist in an unworthy manner. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11, 27. Therefore, when our priests were warned about this sin, private masses were discontinued among us, since hardly any private masses were celebrated except for the sake of filthy gain. Um, so again, 1 Timothy uh, 3, I, I just went 1 through 3, so to give you the context for what Paul's talking about, he's telling Timothy, what the office of overseer, pastor, right, um, or bishop or whatever should look like um, and what that person should look like. And it has to be somebody who's above reproach, husband of one wife, sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. And so that's what the article is quoting. Um, and uh, so here's what's happening in a private mass, right? You're paying someone to get the benefits of what's occurring in the mass, right? Um, uh, a fancy Latin word would be ex opere operato, the work being performed. So just the work of having a mass would do something for whoever it's being said in honor of. So your relative is dead, they're in purgatory. You're like, hey, monks, I need you to, you know, here's some money, some gold or whatever. Uh, I need you to perform a mass um, for my dead relative because I want to get them some benefits to lower that sentence of purgatory. That was occurring, right? The next thing was that the idea of vocation of, of you being a, a priest or a monk um, that uh, if I'm just a farmer, that's all I'm going to do. And I don't really need to be a, I don't really need to go to worship, right? And um, I'll just pay someone to do it for me, right? Um, and 
you can see that in the architecture of European cathedrals and churches because they're built uh, and when they're built, they're not built to hold the capacity of the city that they're built for. You can't fit everybody in there. And, and so really the idea is not everyone's going, right? And, and I can just, you know, I'll pay me, I'll pay my money, right? I'll, okay. I'll cut the church grass, right? I'll do uh, clean the church. I'll, uh, you know, plant some flowers. I'll paint. I'll fix the air conditioning. That's sufficient. I don't need to go to worship, right? I don't need to receive any gifts from God because I'm doing this. And again, that's it's just functional paganism where you're trying to invoke God's favor um, uh, without actually just receiving what he wants to give you. Um, and so worship is for God's people. It's not for God, right? Um, and, uh, and again, God doesn't need anything from us. Um, he doesn't need our praise. Um, and, and often he works without it. I mean, the, the rain falls on the evil person and the good person, right? And so um, he doesn't need anything from us. That's what makes him God. If he needed something, then he wouldn't be God. And so um, God is the one doing um, in that regards and teaching his people. Um, and this doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference whether communion is served or not. It's just a mass in general. It doesn't matter about communion. You can't have, you can't have a mass without communion. You can't have a divine service without Lord's Supper. So you can have a service of the word and we do things like matins and morning prayer and evening prayer and prayer and preaching, but that's not a divine service. That's not a mass. So did they have additional services in Luther's time and that were not where communion was celebrated? Yeah, absolutely. They did. Uh, but uh, the idea of having a Sunday service um, uh, without um, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, um, at least privately by, so if you're talking about a Roman Catholic priest, privately by the priest, you know, where the people are just not partaking of it, but they're just watching it. I mean, it's, it, that's going on. Mass has to have the, the sacrament of the altar. Um, and, you know, on top of that, again, uh, monks and, and priests and all this stuff, they, they prayed the hours, the office hours of the church. So they prayed matins and vespers and um all the other ones that i can't remember at the top of my head right now um and again the great thing about the lutheran reformation was that we took all those prayer offices and and we brought them out to the people and to say you know your work is first and foremost to be a christian and so god commands you to pray he wants you to pray and so these offices these services are designed to help structure your prayers um and so matins vespers i mean those are very lutheran things to do um because they're not doing matins and vespers at the roman catholic church i mean at least i don't know so they didn't come back till after the reformation um so faith comes through hearing hearing through the word of christ romans 10 17 um, and so you got to have uh, people there uh, receiving those gifts. No more private masses. Do they still do private masses in the Roman Catholic Church? Yes. You could still pay for a mass. Um, and when I was in the chaplain school, the Roman Catholic priests would do mass every single day. And if they wanted to, they could do it in their room. So the guy would do it in his room. He would have a private mass in his room before the start of the day with no one there but him. So, which again, is not really in line with God's word, right? Two or three are gathered in my name, right? I am with you. He's talking about the supper, right? He's talking about the sacrament. He's with you. And, um, but you got to have people gathered there <laughs> for the benefit of receiving it, not just doing it. Um, the work of doing it. Oops. Oops. And uh, okay. A quote from Luther, right? 
Um, it is not now, nor has uh, been our intention to abolish the liturgical service of God completely, but rather to purify the one that is now in use um, for the uh, wretched um, corruption that's happening um, and to point out an evangelical use. So again, the proclamation of the gospel is what, um, and the, and the, uh, uh, the consolation, the, the easing of a burdened conscience. Part three, uh, the article goes on and says, an opinion was added uh, that infinitely increased private masses. It states that Christ by his passion made satisfaction for original sin and instituted the mass as an offering for daily sins, both venal and mortal, All right? This is what was happening in the Roman Catholic church. It still happens now. And we'll talk about that. Um, from this opinion also arisen the common belief that the mass takes away the sins of the living and the dead simply by performing the outward act. Ex uh, opere operato, the work being performed. You don't have to receive it, you just watch it, or you know that it's being done. And then they begin to argue about whether one mass said for many is worth as much as a special masses for individuals. Uh, this resulted in an infinite number of masses um, with this work, people wanted to obtain from God all that they needed, um, and in the meantime, trust in Christ and true worship were forgotten. So again, uh, private masses, paid masses to celebrate an individual, their, uh, the Lutheran Reformation uh, got rid of those, um, because there was this idea of, uh, by the medieval period, you pay me for a mass, that mass is more important than the regular mass that's happening on a Sunday because, you know, you're paying it for me, or we're going to do a special mass for our uh, Duke or the Prince. And that's a greater mass than any other mass, you know, and um, uh, it becomes a thing of money and power, which, um, you know, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's a really biblical thing uh, to make it about. Um, and yeah, so then, I mean, people just eventually just view it as it's a transaction. I'm going to make a transaction and God's going to take care of me, um, even though I'm not actually receiving anything from him. Uh, real quick to talk about this statement I had bold and underline Christ by his passion made satisfaction for original sin and instituted the mass as an offering for daily sins, both venal and mortal. That is a Roman Catholic mass. That is the sacrifice of the mass. So it's really the, the, the chief abomination of what's happening in the medieval period. They're saying that when Jesus, in the, in the divine service, in the Eucharist, Jesus is um, being re-sacrificed to forgive the sins that are being committed, that have been committed by you up until that point. So his death on the cross was the death that made satisfaction for original sin that, that we inherit from Adam and Eve. But the sins that you commit, um, you, he needs to be sacrificed for that. Um, and that's why you would hear language in a Roman Catholic church of the sacrifice of the mass um, and, uh, and all these things. Um, and so uh, it becomes really uh evil at that point um, because as jesus death on the cross was that just for original sin well it's for everything right it's the 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 once for all sacrifice which is what uh scripture talks about uh for our justification and so does it forgive your the sins of the past and present and the future yeah it forgives everything it's it and so what we're doing is in the service, we're remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made, and he's giving us the vehicle by which he gives out his forgiveness. Because, I mean, if you were here on Monday, Thursday, when we talked about the, in the sermon, you weren't present at the cross, right? You, you know, blood forgives sins, right? Leviticus uh, 17, 5, right? The only thing that can forgive sins is blood. And so you weren't present at the cross, you know, Jesus' physical blood wasn't spread on you. And so he needs to give a way to give that to you, you know, 2,000, some 2,000 years later and, and many miles from Jerusalem. 
And so he gives that to you in the Lord's Supper, um, gives it to you in holy baptism. I mean, that's what those things are doing. It, so are you completely forgiven of all your sins in your baptism? Yeah. Are you completely forgiven of all your sins in the Lord's Supper? Yeah. Are you completely forgiven of all your sins in the absolution pronounced over you? Yeah. Right. And so um, it becomes less about you trying to calculate in your head the sins I'm committing and when I'm going to be attending mass. And if I could just, you know, sort of aim it up just right, you know, it becomes God is just giving gifts. He's giving them to you. And you're, uh, you don't even know uh, how much you're receiving, uh, but it's more than you could ever want. So uh, Article 24 teaches when you talk about the sacrifice of the mass that they're talking about, that there's no sacrifice uh, either for original sin or for other sins, except for the one death of Jesus as satisfaction for all sins. Pretty clear in scripture, right? We obtain grace and are justified before God through faith, not through works. So is it the work of doing the divine service that, that uh, uh, is justifying us? No, it's the word, right? To include the word made flesh. It's the gospel that does that. Um, and so the mass has not been instituted as a sacrifice for sin, but is there to awaken faith and comfort us in receiving grace and forgiveness right? Uh, if it's faith alone, then it's about God giving me faith. And that's what he does um, in the divine service. He's not, um, he's not reinstituting sacrifices like we're in some kind of crazy temple in the Old Testament. That's already been done with. Um, yeah, we talked about this, not just the priest, right? Mass is a communion. It's a communal meal in which it's priest, pastor, and people, they receive it regularly. Um, and so um, this is what Luther and, and, and in Article 24, they're talking about. They've now, uh, they're doing this in an evangelical way, in the evangelical churches, um, even Gaelish, right? So uh, that's what they call themselves. It's kind of important to point that out, because if we say, if I say evangelical now, and you'll notice that sometimes I say evangelical in a snidey, not nice term, right? Because I'm talking about broader sense, just other Protestants. But um, Lutherans never called themselves Lutheran. They were always even Gaelish. If you go to Germany, you want to go to the church, it's the even Gaelish church, right? Evangelical Catholic, Augsburg Catholic, that's what they call themselves. Part four, right? Uh, because the Mass, for the purpose of giving the sacrament, we have communion every holy day. This is in Article 24 of the Augsburg Confession. And if anyone desires a sacrament, we also offer it on other days uh, when it is given uh, to all who ask for it. So here's, if you ever asked yourself or somebody asked you, why at this church do we have communion every day? Because what makes us Lutheran is in Article 24, and Article 24 says, because the Mass is for the purpose of giving the sacrament, we have communion every day. Um, and we offer it. If anyone desires to have the Lord's Supper, I will give it to them, right? If they're in the hospital and they say, oh, I, Pastor, come and visit me, I have the Lord's Supper, boom, gone, right? Happens all the time. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, that's, Really, really what the pastoral office is for, it's absolution man to hand out the gifts of God, right, which we talked about in like Article 5 and all these things like that. He deals out the gospel, so why wouldn't you have, um, why wouldn't you have communion? Um, also, if you're going to, if you're going to, for the sake of time, if you're going to cut out anything from the church service, the thing you shouldn't cut out is the thing that's very explicit about forgiving your sins and being present with the Lord. Um, if anything, we'll cut out the offertory hymn um, or, you know, the hymn of the day can go before we cut out the Lord's Supper in order to make a time limit if we're going to be so constrained. Um, but then we have to have, if that, if that becomes the, the banner cry, then, then, uh, then we have to have a conversation about devoting two and a half hours to a movie theater, but not 
anything over an hour to church. Um, and that's all law there. So every holy day, right? Acts 2.42, this is what they did. The church has been birthed in Acts 2, right? Pentecost is here. We'll celebrate that in, in less than 50 days now, um, right? Because Jesus, after his resurrection, 40 days later, he ascended to the Father. And then 50 days after his resurrection was the day of Pentecost. We'll celebrate that in June. And so um, this is what they did right after the day of Pentecost. They, which is, means the devoted people of God that are now baptized and in the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. Um, so it's very, uh, very biblical to do those things every time we gather. Um, and also the article, uh, Article 24, cites the early church. So remember, it cites the Bible, and then it cites the church fathers, the, what the church had always been doing. And so the early church was doing communion every day. Uh, it quotes uh, Christendom, uh, Christendom, who says that uh, the priest stands daily at the altar, inviting some to commune and keeping others back. So that means the Lord's Supper is offered just like it is here, um, but people don't have to take it. Um, and again, you examine yourself and... Um, you know, in some cases, um, in terms of pastoral care, some people are in a state of sin that they need to be awoken from that and repent. And so the Lord's Supper is something that they haven't properly examined themselves and so that they uh, should not partake of. Because again, if you eat or drink of it unworthily, Paul talks about condemnation. And in, in Corinth, they were getting sick. I mean, they were literally getting sick uh, because if you ever want to learn about bad things to do in the church service, just read First Corinthians, because they were doing about as everything bad they could do, um, like getting drunk at the service and things like that. Um, and then to wrap it up here on the uh, back page on page four, uh, I, I've used this graphic before. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but uh, our path to of worship, right? So just showing how everything we're doing is is retelling um, is retelling Christ's full story. It's the fullness of the gospel um, in terms of what we learn. Um, Christ's life, his perfect life, his death and, and resurrection and all those things. So um, we're, we're recreating uh, the church year in a smallest sense in the service. And that's what's being communicated in the service. It's teaching people that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's designed to, to be that way. Um, and it has all of these Jewish antecedents as well. So these things that, that were done in synagogal worship, that are done in temple worship, um, that are done in the Passover meal, and now they're communicated in the fullness of being fulfilled in Christ, in worship. And so we follow that same pattern that's prescribed by God. Um, and I think it's good to not just make it up um, because I don't, we're not, we're not of our own, right? So the things we do as a church, they're not just because we're, we're our separate church away from everything else. We walk in unity and fellowship with all the other churches of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And I would argue even the broader sense is Lutheran because we carry that name. And so the things we do here in church, right, as each individual member of this church does, it represents all of us. I mean, if I go out and rob the Casey's, you better believe people are going to think poorly about our church because the pastor went out and robbed the Casey's, right? And the same thing can occur for any member who's here. And so that even gets played out for a larger sense, you know, for the, for the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If we are doing things that are contrary to what we believe or that are bad, um, then, you know, that's going to reflect on who we are as a church. Um, just like as a Christian, it reflects full, the fullness of the Christian church as well. So, um, yeah. So, uh, 
if you're ever interested in it, I do have a few books. So Gathered Guests is actually the guide to worship. Uh, it's the it's pretty easy to read, but it actually has everything in it. Just so you know, I'm not making things up. It's all uh, it's all in here. Um, and then this book, you might like this, but it, it's it's a heavier read. Um, Heaven and Earth. So it's it's Art Just, who is a professor at the Fort Wayne Seminary. It's like his, I think it's his doctoral dissertation, you know, in a book that talks about what we do. Um, and Luther has some books too, uh, that some things that he wrote, but as far as um, about worship, he didn't write as much as he did about everything else. He reformed the mass, he kept a lot of it, and then they just continued <clears throat> to go on and do what they were doing. Um, so interesting. Any questions, thoughts? Yes, ma'am. I might have missed it, I'm sorry, but um, what, who gets the money when they gave the money for the mass? Did the preacher oh. keep it or did the mm -hmm. church get it? So the church would keep it, right? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so, you know, if you pay the monastery, you're paying the monks, uh, you're paying the church. The church itself pays a tithe to the greater church, to like the diocese and then the archdiocese and then the, you know, the Holy See, the Pope and stuff like that. They would take a tax, they would call it. And, um, but yeah, so you had people paying big money. I mean, we're not talking about like, I think often we think of monks living in like Friar Tuck, you know, squalor, but these are, these are monks and bishops and, and places that are, have a bunch of land and they're acquiring a ton of money and power. Um, and that plays into some of this as well, but yeah, they would, they would keep it. So you guys pay me to be your pastor. You don't pay me to do a a divine service. I do that because I'm, it's part of my vocation and call. If you stopped paying me, I would still do it. So, because, um, you know, payment is just uh, a wonderful thing. That's very scriptural to say, we want to take care of you. Uh, but it's not, <coughs> it's not gaining you any type of extra benefit. So, um, but, um, but yeah, still <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I say that too loud, yeah. Right. I want to eat. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, and so some of this still happens, not even in Roman Catholic Church. Think about, you know, this pay to pray kind of stuff like TV evangelist and, you know, pay to get. I mean, it's it's literal medieval Catholicism revisited, you know. I mean, you, you pay $20 to some guy and he'll send you anointing oil or something like that. Or, you know, they'll give you a special, it's a year of Jubilee and God's going to bless you. Just send $20. You know, they always have that accent. So, um, which is actually my true accent. I just hide it when I'm here. <laughs> I might be mistaken, but when my dad was dying, my sister wanted him to, she's Catholic, Catholic. Um, so wanted him to be baptized. I'm pretty sure she had to pay the priest to come visit him. Yeah. Yeah. So he he baptized my dad, and you know, essentially he became Catholic before he passed away. But I'm pretty right. sure we had to pay him for that. And he was telling me, I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had to pay? My my dad died, and my mom remarried, and she remarried somebody who was uh, divorced. And in the Catholic Church, you know, they don't support divorce. So they said, well, we can annul your divorce if you pay us $2,000. Mm -hmm. And so they obviously didn't do it in the Catholic Church. Yeah, $2,000. So we'll make, we'll make your divorce he wasn't, a, he wasn't a member of the church. I hope yeah. he doesn't mm -hmm. charge members mm -hmm. of the church to do this. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I thought that was strange. But, but maybe that's usually, common. you usually give a gift? You know. Mm -hmm. Well, you give something on an honorarium, yeah. right? So then, I mean, I, when I, I just performed a wedding not too long ago, and they were gracious enough to send me an honorarium, it's certainly not required, I would have done it without it. But, um, but yeah, so I mean, uh, but, uh, okay, so when you have a structure that gets built, that's an enormous bureaucracy, right, and has this huge hierarchy of, of levels of people, um, I mean, you're going to, 
you're going to have things like payments for stuff. Um, I don't think that's un, unheard of. Um, but maybe maybe that's what we'll put out here. You know, I'll baptize you for free. Uh, you know. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Um, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God and Lee Father, we, we give you thanks for, for coming to us, for, for giving us all of the things that we need in this life to forgive our sins for life and salvation. Lord, we, we ask that you would help us in the divine service to have faith to see what is being communicated to us and what is happening to us and to this world in your service and to the coming of your kingdom. And Lord, uh, bless us as we wrap up our uh, study of the Augsburg Confession. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.